Hey YouTube, welcome back. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the Crusades. We're going to trace the development of all the Crusades, explaining the goals of each Crusade, and talking about how the Crusades affected the relationship between the Eastern and Western churches. I'd also like to consider how this Christian movement of the Crusades created the concept of jihad, and how this concept of the sword relates to evangelistic practices today. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. You know, the Crusades are often brought up as an argument against Christianity. Go into any college classroom, and the professor is sure to bring up the Crusades in an attempt to put down Christians. Unfortunately, most of the people who talk about the Crusades do not actually have an in-depth understanding of them. They probably do not know how many Crusades that there were, let alone understand the specifics of each of the seven Crusades and the eighth and final battle in the year 1291 that ended them. From around the year 200 AD all the way up until 900 AD, the land of Israel, Jordan, Syria, and Turkey, and Egypt, Egypt as well, were inhabited primarily by Christians. Once Islam grew and became powerful, Muslims invaded, oppressed, enslaved, and even murdered Christians that were living in the area. The Roman Catholic Church, along with the emperors from Europe, ordered the Crusades to reclaim the land that was taken not just to stop the persecution of Christians. The fight was absolutely justified, but it evolved into a fight over territory. The actions of some of these Christians at that time were absolutely terrible, and there is no justification to conquer land in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is a travesty that they are called Christian Crusades because most of the people who changed the focus from simply stopping the abuse to conquering land were not acting like true Christians. The name of Jesus got drugged through the mud through the actions of these crusaders. The crusades took place between the years of 1095 AD all the way up until the year 1230 AD. So now let's talk about each of the crusades and we'll start with the first crusade. If there were any of the Crusades that were even remotely justified or successful, it was this first one. This Crusade was started by Urban II in the year 1095 and is known as the Popular Crusade. Peter the Hermit, along with Walter the Penniless, led the first of the Crusaders who were mostly poor peasants. They went into the Holy Land with very little planning involved, but they succeeded in taking Jerusalem in the year 1099 AD. So now we're going to talk about the Second Crusade. The Second Crusade was the result of the Turks taking control of the city of Edessa in the year 1144 AD, and the Muslims were threatening northern Jerusalem. Bernard of Clairvaux endorsed the Crusade, the results were very negligible on this one, and it ultimately failed because the Muslims took Jerusalem back in the year 1187 AD. Now, we're going to talk about the Third Crusade. The Third Crusade was fought in direct response to the Muslims taking Jerusalem in 1187. Its main leaders were Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa, King Philip II, Augustus of France, and King Richard the Lionhearted of France. This is also known as the King's Crusade. It is important to note that Frederick died on the way to battle. Philip went home, meaning that only Richard actually continued all the way and made it into the battle. They were unsuccessful in recapturing Jerusalem. However, they did negotiate some travel rights because Richard negotiated in agreement with Sultan Saladin that allowed Christians to make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem so they could travel through the area. The Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade was an absolute 
disaster. It was brought on by Innocent III. Instead of attacking the Muslims, they attacked the Christian city of Constantinople, establishing it as the Latin Empire of Constantinople from the years 1204 AD all the way until 1261 AD. Well, this placed the church's leadership under a Latin patriarch, which was supposed to end the split between the Eastern and Western churches. Well, it didn't happen that way because this move hurt the feelings and completely offended the Greek-speaking Eastern Christians, pitting them against the Latin-speaking Western Christians. This separated the two even more, being that the Greek-speaking Christians were now subject to the Pope. The Fifth Crusade. This crusade happened in the year 1219 AD when Egypt was attacked, but the crusaders only managed to take the ports of Damietta. Damietta. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but the crusaders only managed to take the port of Damietta. This port was taken back by the Muslims two years later, so it was very short-lived. The Sixth Crusade. This crusade was led by King Louis IX of France. This crusade ended in a small quarter of Jerusalem being negotiated, but again, it just didn't last very long. They were conquered again by the Turks very shortly thereafter, and a lot of lives were lost. The Seventh Crusade. Crusade number seven. This Seventh Crusade is by far one of the most horrendous acts in all of history. The Seventh Crusade was also called for by King Louis IX and is known as the Children's Crusade. Children and teenagers with an average age of 12 were sent in to fight. The Muslims slaughtered them in cold blood. It was a bloodbath as all of the Crusades were. Now the final battle. There was one last battle in the year 1291 AD that is called the Fall of Acre, which officially ended the Crusades, even though it is not actually considered by some scholars a crusade. This is terrible, terrible stuff. So in conclusion, we have learned what the Crusades were, what they were about, and that they were not a good example of Christian behavior, being that they evolved from a noble cause to end persecution, they evolved into a fight over territory. At best, they were a bad example. At worst, some of these people were not Christians at all. This brings up the question as to why the unbiblical actions of these supposed Christians who lived hundreds of years ago has anything to do with Christianity today? Well, the answer is, it doesn't. This most often is a smokescreen for those who want to take the focus off of themselves needing Jesus and to put us on the defensive. It is also important to note that many of the Islamic terrorists today claim to be doing what they're doing as revenge for what happened in the Crusades. This also brings up the question of how this applies to evangelism and making laws. Can we as Christians force society to live by God's rules and standards, even though they don't want anything to do with God and they've rejected him? You know, I was looking at a comment online that one person was making on an article in response to a Christian post that said homosexuality is against God's law. Another person responded by saying, God's mad. We get it. That post is, it's so true. Many people are choosing. They are choosing to reject what is pleasing to God. God honors their choice, even though it breaks his heart. But can we as Christians really make laws to force people to live by God's standard if they don't want to? This is a whole new way of looking at the issue. You know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But can I impose that on a pagan, unbelieving world? Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.